We are This Week in Amateur Radio, now celebrating our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1199 of This Week in Amateur Radio. An Erie, Pennsylvania amateur is charged with making bomb threats and broadcasting fake emergency weather bulletins on the air. We will have the details. The Orlando Hamcation visitors rediscover radio as the ARRL holds its 2022 National Convention. In-person registration is now open for the 2022 ham site workshop. Pirate radio stations appear on 3,500 and 7,000 kilohertz on upper sideband. The upcoming 3Y0J de-expedition to Beauvais Island announces its departure date. A train of geomagnetic storms led to the loss of 40 Starlink satellites. We will have additional information this week. The ARRL International DX Contest will include new categories, and there are some rule changes for this year's contest as well. A dual club special event station will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the pioneering radio station WGY AMA 10 in Schenectady, New York. And you will be able to work Pluto in an upcoming special operation on the low bands. We will tell you how in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, We'll talk about a new problem on the net, fake Windows 11 upgrade installers that contain malware. And he will also talk about how the European Union now requires on-screen notifications when a web page is setting a cookie on your computer. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, explores the idea that a picture can say a lot more than words. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to the year 1958. It was the year amateurs had two satellites to listen to, Sputnik and Explorer, and it was also the year that the FCC ran out of call signs. He will take a look at the radios amateurs had to choose from that year as well. We'll have an update from Parks and Summits on the air, our own Tower and Antenna Master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will take a look at Lockout Tagout, which is something you need to know about if your repeater antenna is mounted on a commercial tower before you climb. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from my home studio in Cortlandville, New York, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the Catskill Mountains, where we're surrounded by maple trees where our mode of this week will be get, getting outside and tapping those maple trees as the sap is beginning to flow. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, just back from a wonderful week at the Orlando Hamcation, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where if you don't like the weather, just wait about five minutes, it'll change. I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where it's warm one day and cold the next, just typical winter weather. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off our news this week is this late-breaking story. The Erie Times News reports on the case of an amateur radio operator, Richard L. Wagner, N3BWG, age 61, of Erie, Pennsylvania. He's been accused of making bogus weather emergency reports, including reports for tornadoes and bomb threats on ham radio over several months in 2021. Detectives wrote in the affidavit filed with the complaint that when Wagner was confronted by other radio operators to cease and desist, the defendant interferes in communications by playing touch tones, 
threatening to smash the knees of members with a baseball bat and threatening to place a bomb in the stairwell of an eerie apartment building where he lives. County detectives accuse Wagner of transmitting bomb threats over ham radio while using a computer synthesizer to disguise his voice. The defendant has threatened to place bombs in buildings which include the City of Erie Police Department, the Erie County Courthouse, several residential housing units throughout the county, and a local eatery, detectives wrote in the affidavit. Detectives also wrote that Wagner threatened to send a pipe bomb in the mail to a resident of Erie County. The victim notified the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, which county detectives assisted in making contact with Wagner at his residence on February 1st, according to the affidavit. Investigators said Wagner denied making the pipe bomb threat. Detectives also wrote that Wagner commented on how in the past he assisted a private company in developing and writing a software program for a radio transmitter or repeater and stated his amateur radio call sign. Erie County detectives charged that Wagner aired the false weather emergency reports and the bomb threats via the Erie Radio Association transmitter or transmitters. The transmitters are used by the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency and Erie County Emergency Management in the event of regional, state, or national emergencies. Wagner was in the Erie County prison on a $250,000 bond after Erie 5th Ward District Judge Paul Bazzaro arraigned him on charges including 11 first-degree misdemeanor counts for each of the bomb threats and each terroristic threat. We will keep an eye on this story and bring you updates as they become available. After being postponed because of the COVID-19 pandemic, visitors to Orlando Hamcation 2022 and the AWRL National Convention got to rediscover radio on February 10th to the 13th. With more details on how amateurs rediscovered radio at the Hamcations, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. This marked the 75th Hamcation, which typically attracts upward of 20,000 visitors. In addition to the chance to meet old friends in person and hit that flea market, Orlando Hamcation and ARRL offered a broad range of forums, presentations, and social events. Kicking off the ARRL National Convention's four training tracks was Contest University, which made its Hamcation debut just ahead of the show on February 10th. The Emergency Communications Academy training track offered a panel of nationally recognized experts and trainers who covered current protocols, techniques, and responsibilities for the Amateur Radio Volunteer Service Public Safety Entities. The Amateur Radio Emergency Service, ARIES, topped the list of discussion topics, message handling during emergencies using WinLink, and emergency power were some of the others. More than 120 people attended. Popular YouTuber Josh Nass, KI6NAZ, guided the hands-on handbook training track, which covered such topics as parks on the air, amateur satellites, basic amateur radio programming, and remote operating. Topics featured in the Technology Academy training track included SWR, compliance with the new FCC RF exposure rules, digital communications technology, digital television, and solar cycle 25 and space weather. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Contest University presenters discussed various facets of competitive ham radio, addressing such topics as single sideband audio, mobile QSO party contesting, attracting and retaining young operators into the radio sport fold, and World Radio Sport Team Championship 2023 in Italy. The diversity of presenters' backgrounds was a key to the patently successful day-long session. Just about every facet of knowledge and experience was represented, said track leader Rick Palm, K1CE. The AWRL Emergency Communications Forum served as an introduction to AWRL Director of Emergency Management Josh Johnston, KE5MHV. Johnston led a panel that included Section Emergency Coordinators Arc Thames, W4CPD, and Christine Duez, K4KJN, and Public Information Coordinator Scott Roberts, KK4ECR, all from Florida. Students and advisors from college and university radio clubs attended the AWRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Forum. Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB, moderated the AWRL Member Forum, which gave attendees an opportunity to meet and ask questions of AWRL leadership. 
2022 is going to be another big year, ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA, told those attending the National Convention Luncheon on February 10th. We've been positioning ourselves on MCOM, Radio Sport, increased outreach with youth, as well as the vision impaired, and the development of a long-term strategy, all of which are deeply embedded in our digital transformation of ARRL. Minster said opinions vary on how amateur radio should move forward. It's healthy to debate ideas when done the right way, he said. At headquarters, we look through the lens every single day of, is this good for ARRL? And is this good for ham radio? It's hard, especially if it isn't your idea or the way you think things should go. But when we get there, we need to hold hands and make things happen for our members and our hobby. Be willing to sacrifice your personal and political aspirations by putting ARRL and ham radio first and at the forefront. Visit the official convention photo album for more highlights. Heil Sound has changed hands. Founded by Bob Heil, K9EID, and based in Fairview Heights, Illinois, Heil Sound is a manufacturer of microphones, microphone accessories, and audio accessories for both professionals and amateurs. The new owners are Heil Sound President and Chief Executive Officer Ash Levitt and Director of Operations Steve Warford. Sarah Heil, who was co-founder of Heil Sound, has retired, but Bob Heil will continue to do outreach work and amateur radio product design as founder and CEO emeritus. My life has been about achieving great sound, whether on the concert stage or in the amateur radio world, Bob Heil recounted. I've watched Heil Sound go from a regional sound company to a world-class microphone manufacturer. This company has been my passion, but it is time for me to step aside. There is no better team to carry the company forward than Ash and Steve, and I have the utmost confidence in them. Heil Sound is a name well known within the worldwide amateur radio community for its microphones and boomset microphone headset combinations. The company marked its 50th anniversary in 2016. The company began in 1966 as Ye Old Music Shop a music store in Marissa, Illinois, Heil's hometown. Heil initially made a name for himself working with music performers to provide sound reinforcement for their live gigs, initially supplying full sound system packages for venues and festivals throughout the Midwest and later working with world-class acts such as Humble Pie, The Who, The Grateful Dead, and Joe Walsh, WB6ACU. Heil said it was the Dead's Jerry Garcia who suggested the Heil Sound name. Among other innovations, Heil created the Quadraphonic Sound System for the Who's Quadrophenia Tour, as well as the Heil Talk Box, made famous by Joe Walsh and Peter Frampton. Levitt and Warford both started working with Heil Sound as teenagers, building and packaging products. Levitt took a different career path in academia for several years, but continued to regularly consult with Heil Sound. He returned to Heil Sound full-time in 2017 and assumed the role of president in 2020. Warford worked his way up in the company over the course of his tenure and, for the past several years, has been responsible for daily operations. Steve and I are honored to carry forward the legacy of Heil Sound, Levitt said. We care very deeply about Heil Sound's role in the industry and intend to build on that going forward with new products and greater distribution. An important part of that role that we pride ourselves on is the connection we have with professionals and end users. As a musician and former broadcaster, I have spent a lot of time on stages and in studios in front of a microphone and understand our users' needs. I and everyone at Heil Sound share a passion for what we do because it helps others achieve their creative endeavors. Heil Sound has been in business since 1966. And by the way, this story was recorded using a Heil PR40 microphone. Thanks, Bob. Registration is now open for the in-person portion of the 2022 hybrid Ham SCI workshop. With all the details on how to register, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report. Space weather woman Tabitha Scove, WX6SWW, will be a featured guest. The fifth annual HamSci hybrid in-person and virtual workshop will take place March 18th and 19th at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. The theme of the 2022 workshop is the weather connection. 
This workshop will also serve as a team meeting for the HAMSI Personal Space Weather Station Project, a National Science Foundation-funded initiative to develop a citizen science instrument for studying space weather from your backyard. The 2022 HAMSI Workshop is organized by the University of Scranton in collaboration with the University of Alabama and NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. In-person workshop registration closes on March 7th. Virtual participation is free. Registration for the virtual workshop will be available in early March. A tentative workshop agenda has been posted www.hamsci.org. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Registration rates for the in-person workshop are Friday registration, $45, includes conference talks and presentations, and a continental breakfast, lunch, and refreshments. Saturday registration is also $45, including conference talks and presentations, and continental breakfast, lunch, and refreshments. Friday's banquet is $60. Saturday hors d'oeuvre reception is $40. A clandestine radio station, yeah, they're still around, started appearing in late December on 3,500 and 7,000 kilohertz, broadcasting on upper sideband. The signal could be heard throughout Europe with programming in both Italian and English directed against government COVID measures. Daniel Mollier, DL3RTL, International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System Coordinator from the DARC, that's the German Amateur Radio Club, said he was able to determine the approximate location of these transmissions and that the DARC Intruder Monitoring cooperated with the German Telecommunications Authority, BNETSA, to work with their Italian colleagues to obtain measures that led to the termination of these transmissions. As in the past many months, January saw many high-power over-the-horizon radar intrusions, which can operate on significant segments of spectrum. Transmissions from broadcaster Radio Ethiopia and Voice of Broad Masses continued on 7110 and 7140 kilohertz, respectively. The Radio Society of Great Britain's Examination Standards Committee and the Exam Syllabus Review Group have released the latest version of the UK Amateur Radio Examination Syllabus. It's Syllabus 2019 version 1.5. New rules from the UK regulator Ofcom require all radio amateurs to comply with the recently introduced international guidelines for limiting exposure to electromagnetic fields. The updated syllabus includes learning points relating to these new license conditions. The adoption date for this version is the 1st of September 2022, meaning that after that date, the examinations will include questions on the new EMF-related material at all three license levels. You can see the updated syllabus on the RSGB website, www.rsgb.org forward slash syllabus 2019. After taking a few detours over the past couple of years due to the COVID-19 pandemic, AWRL field day rules are being updated on a permanent basis starting this summer. With all the details and rule changes for field day 2022, we go to Ellsworth, Maine, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. ARRL conducted a field day community survey with invitations propagated far and wide and direct emails sent to more than 15,000 individuals and ARRL affiliated clubs. After sorting through, reviewing, and discussing the survey results, the ARRL Programs and Services Committee recommended a number of rule changes for ARRL field day, which will take place this year over the June 25th, 26th weekend. Starting this year, the maximum PEP output for a transmitter used by anyone, at least if you're turning in a log, will be 100 watts. The power multiplier of 2 will remain in place and the high power category will be removed from the rules. Until this year, the maximum low power limit had been 150 watts. The power multiplier will remain at 5 for QRP participants running a maximum of 5 watts or less. 
A couple of changes instituted initially as accommodations for the COVID-19 pandemic will remain in place. Class D home stations will continue to be able to earn points for contact with other Class D stations. The club aggregate scoring change initiated in 2020 as a temporary measure will become part of the permanent rules in the aggregate scoring plan. The scores of individual stations are combined under the score of a single club. Another change involving Rule 7.3.2, Media Publicity, rules to date have offered 100 bonus points for attempting to obtain publicity and demonstrating same. With the ease of posting via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and various other media websites, now you gotta get it. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. As previously announced, 100 watts is now the low power category limit for all ARRL and International Amateur Radio Union HF contests, effective January 1, 2022. And this reminder, as Rick said in his report, field day participants will now be required to obtain publicity, not just try to do so. Any combination of bona fide media hits would qualify for the bonus points. For example, posting the details of your upcoming or ongoing field day activity or your field day results on a club or news media site on Facebook or via Twitter and Instagram would meet the bonus criteria. Photos and videos are encouraged as part of media posts. The application period for the second camp for young amateur radio operators in North, Central, and South America is now open on youthontheair.org. For radio amateurs aged 15 to 25 interested in attending. With all the registration details you need to know, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report. The Youth on the Air camp is set for June 12th through the 17th at the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting in Westchester Township, Ohio. The submission deadline is March 1st. Applications received before the deadline will be given selection priority. It costs nothing to apply, but a $100 deposit is required upon acceptance. Scholarships and waivers are available. Campers are also responsible for transportation when arriving to and departing from the camp hotel. Travel during camp events is provided, however. Travel assistance may also be available, especially for those traveling from outside the U.S. Campers will be selected and notified by March 15th to encourage attendance from across IARU Region 2. Slots will be held open for campers throughout the Americas. If positions become available, these will be filled from the waiting list. Changes in COVID-19 pandemic status and CDC guidelines and restrictions between now and June may impact plans to host the camp. For additional information, get in touch with Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, at director at youthontheair.org. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. At this time, we have a high level of confidence that hosting the camp in June 12th through the 17th of 2022 will be possible, Rapp said. Should we not be able to host the camp or need to reschedule, we'll let everybody know with as much notice as possible. Appropriate requirements on masking and vaccination status will be announced as needed. The 3Y0J Bouvet Island de-expedition is confirmed January 6, 2023 as its date of departure on board the vessel SV Marama. The de-expedition will make the second most wanted DXCC entity available for the first time in several years. It is complex to plan the logistics of such a huge project like the 3Y0J Bouvet de-expedition, which involves many parties, the de-expedition announced this week. The new date is mainly related to the Marama vessel logistics, but also will enable us to return to Cape Town in late February 2023. The 3Y0J team also confirmed that the de-expedition will run for 44 days overall, with a contingency week for added flexibility. We have contracted 22 days at Bouvet Island, and it means we will spend more than three weeks at Bouvet, the announcement said. As we have the flexibility to still decide the port of departure, Ushuaia, Argentina, or Port Stanley Falkland Islands, this will be done at a later stage. The de-expedition will feature 12 stations with eight CW or single sideband stations and four FT8 stations. 
operators aim to log at least 200,000 contacts. We'll be using the Elecraft K3S, a well-proven in-the-field de-expedition radio as the CW and single sideband radio, and the Sun SDR2DX as the FT8 radio, the de-expedition said. We want to emphasize that the FT8 radios will not be run in unattended robot mode, the de-expedition said. Each FT8 QSO will be initiated by a human operator sitting at Cape Phi on Bouvet. During peak times, we will run up to 12 radios simultaneously. We plan for minimum downtime on the radios, and to achieve this, we will set up the four FT8 stations to run 24-7, so that these can either be run by one operator separately, or be run by any other operator in a simplified SO2R setup. This will be done so that each operator can log into the FT8 machine from his operator position and run CW, single sideband, and FT8 simultaneously. Running several radios by a single operator this way has shown to be very efficient. Stations will be equipped with various 1.5 kilowatt amplifiers, 2 kilowatts PEP for 160 meters. The receive antenna will be a ground independent receive loop system developed by LZ1AQ. It will be located some 300 meters from the camp for use on 160 through 30 meters with the capability to feed up to six receivers. It also permits switching from loop to dipole mode. Five diesel generators will power 3Y0J with one spare. The D-Expedition's co-leaders are Ken Opskar, LA7GIA, Rune Uli, LA7THA, and Aaron Marin, LB1QI. Keep up with the D-Expedition's plans and preparations via the 3Y0J website and the 3Y0J Facebook page. Individuals may support the D-Expedition via the 3Y0J website. Two clubs in the Albany, New York area will join forces to mount a special event to celebrate the 100th anniversary of radio station WGY, 8.10 a.m. in Schenectady, New York, on February 19th and 20th weekend. They'll use the call sign W7Y. The East Greenbush Amateur Radio Association will operate W7Y on February 20th, the day WGY was first signed on in 1922. Joining the celebration will be members of the Schenectady Museum Amateur Radio Association, who will operate W7Y from their station at the museum on Saturday, February 19th. Despite being over a century old itself, amateur radio continues to be a popular hobby around the world, with over 700,000 licensed hams in the U.S. and hundreds of thousands more overseas. Using shortwave frequencies, they're able to communicate over thousands of miles. In addition, since amateur stations operate independently, they do not require external infrastructure, such as internet and cellular devices. This makes amateur radio an ideal resource for emergency communications when events such as hurricanes and earthquakes knock out their traditional communications. WGY's legacy is also tied to shortwave broadcasting. From the 1920s to the 1960s, parent company General Electric operated two powerful shortwave stations from Schenectady, WGEO and WGEA. These stations used powerful transmitters to broadcast programming to the United States, Europe, South America, and Africa. Beginning with the start of World War II, they were turned over to the Voice of America to provide news and information to counter Nazi propaganda. WGY has a long history as a radio pioneer, leading both as technical innovators as well as a leader in developing broadcast radio as a source of entertainment and information, said East Greenbush Amateur Radio Association President Brian Jackson, W2RBJ. Our special event station will use amateur radio to recognize WGY's many achievements by celebrating the 100th anniversary across the nation and around the world. This week we have more details on the tragic conclusion to a missing person story we covered two years ago. The bodies of an amateur radio operator and his companion had been found and had been positively identified. Russell Hill, VK3VZP, and Carol Clay disappeared two years ago in the Victorian bushland where the two had gone camping. The last message heard from Russell was on March 20th of 2020 when he made a QSO on one of the HF bands reporting his location at Wanatagata Valley in the Victorian Alps. No one heard from them again. One day later, campers discovered the radio operator's vehicle and the couple's campsite destroyed by fire. According to Sky News, forensic testing has now confirmed the identity and remains found last November as those of Radio Ham and his friend. A pilot who worked for Jetstar Airways and who had been camping nearby was arrested last November and charged with two counts of murder. The pilot, Greg Lynn, 55, is due in court in May. 
pleased to describe the couple's disappearance as one of the most high-profile cases in recent memory. The upcoming Dayton Hamvention 2002 looks to be a go. With more details on what we can look forward to, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. Hams and vendors hoping to attend Dayton Hamvention 2022 have been asking what, if any, COVID-19 regulations would be in place. Hamvention management says it's monitoring the situation closely. Hamvention General Chairman Rick Allnut, WS8G, issued a statement. We cannot guarantee what government may decide about unknown changes in the pandemic, he said. It's become obvious that the state of Ohio is very unlikely to call a halt to large gatherings anytime soon. Despite a recent spike in Omicron variant COVID cases and hospitalizations, there is no move to restrict large indoor or outdoor events, such as sports events, Allnut said. Allnut added that he anticipates that the official state guidance may be to recommend, not require, face masks and social distancing, but does not expect to be checking attendees' vaccination status on site. Hamvention will support state guidance. Updates on Hamvention and COVID-19 regulations related to the event will be posted on the Hamvention website, www.hamvention.org. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Hamvention, an ARRL-sanctioned event, will be held May 20th through the 22nd at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now, your personal tech guy. What's going on in the world of tech? Word of warning, fake Windows 11 upgrade installers are out there. This is from uh, a site I read a lot, Bleeping Computer, Bill Tulis writing. Threat Actors, this is a great name. I always think of like, I don't know, Sylvester Stallone when you say Threat Actors. That's not what they mean. They mean they mean hackers, bad guys. Threat actors have started distributing fake Windows 11 upgrade installers to Windows 10 users, tricking them into downloading and executing the Redline Stealer malware. Now, I bet you that's not the only one. I bet you they're all, once they figure this out, they're all going to do it because <clears throat> you've seen it, right? If you have Windows 10, Microsoft has start putting up pop-ups saying, Oh, good news. Windows 11. Upgrade now. Oh, good news. Not necessarily good news, but uh, definitely not good news. If you see a pop-up that, and by the way, it looks just like that Microsoft window. <clears throat> you click the link. It takes you to a site that looks just like Microsoft, except look carefully at the URL. Not the padlock. That's locked. It's, and I bet you by now it's been, you know, disabled, but Windows-Upgraded. Dot com. You might even fall for that, right? Windows Dash Upgraded. Of course, that's what Microsoft would would do. Yeah, it's malware. In fact, I think that, you know, and Bleeping Computer says it's the bad guys were wait, just waiting for Microsoft to put those pop-ups out so that they could do the same thing. If you click the Download Now button on that pop-up, and I bet you there are people listening right now who are going, oh, what? Wait a minute. Don't do it. If you click the Download Now button on this Microsoft looking pop-up, you'll download something called Windows 11 installation assistant.zip. What could possibly be wrong with that? Except it doesn't come from Microsoft. And when you open it and run it, it installs malware. What does the malware do? Well, anything, I guess, you know, let me see, let me just, this article doesn't actually say what Redline Stealer does, but I, that's a name should tell you something. It doesn't, it isn't, you know, no, don't do it. This is a, a big problem because it's hard enough for you and me to catch these. You know, I've almost fallen for this stuff. Never yet, but I've almost fallen for this stuff. But think about Uncle Tom and Aunt Betty. They are they don't listen to this show. They're not, you know, they're just normal people. And they see a pop-up that says it's time to upgrade to Windows 11 they're going to click download now. The site looks real. They're going to click it. They're going to run it. And boom, there they go. 
My general solution to this is normal people shouldn't be running Windows. I know, I know you yell at me when I say that, but it's absolute truth. Normal people, unless you want to become a security expert, unless you want to be smart and sophisticated and savvy enough to see this happening and not do it, not fall for it, which is pretty hard, you shouldn't be running Windows. It's too dangerous because it's a general purpose operating system. It can do anything. It's designed to do whatever you want it to do, which means if you let bad guys in, they can do whatever they want to do. So get Uncle Tom and Aunt Betty, uh, you know, a Chromebook or an iPad, something where this stuff doesn't happen. If you went to this on a Chromebook, you'd see the pop-up. It would say your Chromebook can now be upgraded to Windows 11. You might, in fact, if you're Uncle Tom and Uncle, Uncle Aunt Betty even say, well, that's odd. I'm not running Windows 10, but maybe you, maybe you go, oh, good. Finally, Google's given me Windows 11. You click the button, the download proceeds, and nothing else happens because it can't be opened and it can't run. And you'll go, well, I guess I don't get Windows 11 after all. No, you don't get Red Line Stealer. I, I don't know what else to say. If you're going to tell people to buy Windows, and see, I don't, but if you're going to tell people to buy Windows, then I think it's on you to, to go over to their house whenever they get infected and fix it. That's a disincentive, isn't it? Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? Somehow, the notion that cookies of any kind are a bad thing has percolated through the world and, and eventually became incorporated into law in the EU, the European Union. And that's why you see these cookie banners, is there's a law that says, well, if you're going to have cookies, you better ask permission. And this came up for me the other day because I run a, my, my personal website is, is what they call a static blog. There's, it's a very simple there's no blog engine behind this. There's just a bunch of HTML pages. There's some JavaScript. And yeah, it turns out there's some cookies. So I had to put up a little cookie announcement. And I said uh, in a very snarky way uh, on this cookie announcement, yeah, like every other site in the world, I have cookies. Get over it. <laughs> and then there's just a button that says, you know, I think learn more, which takes you to a completely anodyne site that says here's what a cookie is and hide. Cookies are used in a variety of ways. The reason I had to put a cookie up is because I have a setting on my site that can go light mode or dark mode. Some people like this site to be dark text on a light background, like a newspaper, black on white. And some people, especially more nowadays, like the dark mode. You've seen the dark mode where it's a black screen with light text. It's kind of funny because that's how it's all started in computing, right? Green or gray text on a black screen. We've come back to that because it hurts your eyes if you don't go out at all. <laughs> if you're sitting in a darkened room all the time, uh, then you don't want a blazingly bright screen. And most people set their screens too bright anyway, it turns out. And it hurts. I understand. It hurts. Uh, some devices now, like the iPhone, have a setting that says after sunset, before, you know, when it's light out, go light mode. When it's dark out, go dark mode, whatever. Anyway, I have a setting that lets you choose. That seems to me the best thing. There's a little button in the upper right-hand corner, dark or light. Well, unless you want to set that every single time you come, and I guess we could do it that way, I set a cookie, I say, and it's on your site, on your home computer. So it's, it's per computer. It's actually per browser. It says a little thing in there that says, for leo.fm, this person likes dark mode. That's all. That's all. It's not gathering information on you or anything. But because that's a cookie, the European Union regulations require me to put that silly banner up, scaring people and annoying people. Because after all, let's face it, when you see that, you just say, okay, fine, right? I guess some people might go through the cookies. and So all a cookie is is a save a setting to your hard drive. Where people got upset about cookies is something, another kind of cookie called third-party cookies. And that gives, so the way cookies are set up, only the site that set the cookie, in my case, only Leo FM can even see that cookie, can read it. No one else can read it. But folks at Facebook and elsewhere have really messed it up for the rest of us because they figured out Google, oh, wow. If we have a cookie, like you log into Facebook, remember when you face, log into Facebook, you don't have to log in again and again. It remembers you that you were there. It actually saves a cookie, a token, it calls it, that says, yeah, you're you, and just let, you know, go on in and use Facebook. That's a convenience to you. But at the same time, 
Facebook sets cookies that identify you as you. That's the Leo cookie. And then, oh, this was clever of them. They arranged with many other sites. You've seen it, the thumbs up like button. You see those on other sites or log in with Facebook or any variety of little logins or Facebook logos or things like that. And all of those belong to Facebook. So you see where I'm going here? The rules of cookies are only the originating site can read the cookie. Well, Facebook set the cookie, but it means that you go to another site with a Facebook like button. Facebook knows you're there because they see the, the like button. Even if you don't click it, that, that code's coming from their site. So at the same time as they put the like button there, they can say, and by the way, who is this? So Facebook, and, and, and Facebook is notorious for this, even if you're not a member of Facebook, will collect information about you. Every time you visit a site with a Facebook like button on it, you're saying, hey, I'm here. This is me. That's the thing that people should be worried about. Privacy advocates are worried about is this idea of tracking you around the web, even on other sites. I think if you think about it, the idea of a site can save settings like dark mode on your computer so that when you come back, it's dark mode or your password. So when you come back, you don't have to log in again. That's a convenience that isn't a privacy invasion. The privacy invasion comes from tracking you around to other sites. Unfortunately, this all got conflated together and the EU decided all cookies are bad cookies and now we have to put up with this really silly announcement. And I think it has the opposite effect because I think it just kind of, it immunizes you. It, uh, you just, oh yeah, there it is again. Okay, okay, okay. I just wanted to visit the site. Of course, there are better ways to, uh, to prevent cookies, for instance, the browser Firefox has a built-in little Facebook sandboxing thing that says, you know, wherever you go, don't send a signal back to Facebook. The browser can do that. That's a better way to do it than making a law requiring a banner that makes no sense. Anyway, there it's going to be interesting because now there's a new nutrition labels are all the rage, right? That was actually a huge deal when they the U.S. started requiring nutrition labels on packaging. And I think that's been valuable. We can look at the calories, the sodium, the fat. We can pay, pay attention to that. Well, now there's a, a privacy nutrition label being proposed. And I think it's a great idea. Apple's going to do this. That shows you very, it looks just like a privacy label. And it tells you what stuff is going on this what stuff this site is collecting. I think this is a great idea. And I think some lawmakers now are looking at the idea of making this universal. So you could, you know, whenever you go to a site, you could say at the bottom, there's always a privacy link now, by the way, that is another regulation. You're going to have a privacy state policy and so forth and have a link to it. And that privacy link could have a privacy nutrition label that would be easy to read, standardized, everybody to understand what it is. I like that idea. That makes sense. That's better than a, do you want cookies? People, I think that's silly. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. And I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. If there was a buzzword to describe amateur radio in the first three months of 1958, it was satellite. The Russians had launched Sputnik in November of 1957. Thousands of hams tuned in the weak beacon from the satellite on 20 and 40 megacycles. Amateur radio received a lot of publicity as across the nation, many local papers ran articles on the hometown hams and the signals from space. Many amateur operators also were busy building converters for 108 megacycles as the new U.S. Army Signal Engineering Labs in Fort Mammoth, New Jersey had a 50 kilowatt transmitter on that frequency to bounce signals off the moon. The antenna was a 60 foot dish. Those lucky enough to hear it received a special QSL. Also on 108 megacycles was the first U.S. satellite, Explorer, launched in February 1958. Hundreds of reports were received by the ARRL from those who heard it. 
Amateur radio was growing in 1958. The total number of hams was over 160,000, with predictions that we would go over 200,000 by 1960. ARRL membership was also at its highest level, 60,000. In fact, there were so many hams, the FCC was running out of call signs. The traditional 1x3 calls beginning with W or K were almost completely used up, especially in the second and sixth call areas. To alleviate the problem, the FCC began the 2x3 format. Henceforth, new technician, general, and extra class call signs would begin with WA, while novices would get WV. The large growth in the number of licenses was partially due to the popularity of the novice and technician class. Novices had 50 kilocycles on both 80 and 40 meters, a full 150 kilocycles on 15, and voice privileges on the 145 through 147 megacycle portion of 2 meters. The technician class license, which had started out with only 220 megacycles and above, had been given 6 meters in 1955. With the sunspots at their highest peak in 1958, thousands of novices and technicians were on 15 and 6, working worldwide DX and getting WAC, WAS, and even DXCC awards. This upset some higher class licensees, some of whom demanded a reduction in the number of frequencies available to the novice and technician. No frequencies were taken away. However, the ARRL went on record as being against giving technicians any two-meter privileges. It wasn't until the 1970s that technicians would finally get the full two-meter band. Early in the year, the ARRL filed a strong opposition to a proposal to remove amateurs from the 11-meter band and establish a citizen's radio service there. Granted, the band was lightly used by hams, it wasn't a worldwide allocation, and there was interference from industrial, scientific, and medical devices on 27.12 megacycles. Still, it was our band, and the ARRL made a good argument for keeping it. The FCC was expected to make a decision by the summer. In technical developments, slow scan TV was first described in the August 1958 issue of QST. Transistors were coming out of the purely experimental stage and were starting to show up in practical circuits. There were several all-transistor power supply and modulator projects, and even a transistorized 10-meter walkie-talkie. Mandatory in any 1958 amateur base station was a broadcast band receiver. Why? In a word, Conelrad. Conelrad was the predecessor to the emergency broadcast system. It used key stations which would broadcast emergency messages on 640 or 1240 kilocycles. Every amateur station had a monitor 640 or 1240 kilocycles while on the air. Mobile operators in contact with a base station did not have to monitor Conelrad. Speaking of mobile, do you want to try it? Just remember the simple 1958 FCC rules. Quote, Notices are required to the FCC engineer in charge of the districts wherein the mobile or portable operation is contemplated when such operation shall be in excess of 48 hours without return to the home address. Also, please remember to include the portable location or mobile itinerary, the dates of the beginning and end of each period of operation away from home, and the registry or license number of the vessel, vehicle, or aircraft from which mobile operation is to occur. Unquote. Got that? If you still want to try mobile, then consider the new Collins KWM-1 mobile transceiver. It's a 175-watt input sideband CW rig, which covers the 20, 15, 11, and 10-meter bands. You can get it for only $695. Let's take a look at the other 1958 rigs out there. Halicrafters had several receivers, the SX-99 at $150, the SX-100 for $295, and the SX-101 at $395. On the transmitter side, there was the HT-32, a 144-watt input AM sideband CW unit, which covered the 80, 40, 20, 15, 11, and 10-meter bands for $675. Johnson Viking transmitters ranged in price from $55 for a basic CW kit 
to $950 for a 600 watt sideband AM CW assembled unit. You can choose a good companion receiver from Hammerland from the HQ100, $170, to the HQ150, $294, to the all new HQ160, $379. For VHF operators, the Gonset Communicator 3, an AM rig for six or two meters, was introduced at $270. It was civil defense approved, of course. Clegg had the model 62T10, a 2, 6, and 10 meter transmitter. On the budget side, perfect for the novice, was the new National NC60 general coverage receiver for $60. Heathkit, of course, had some excellent bargains from the DX20 CW rig for $35 to the DX40, a 75 watt AM CW rig for 80 through 10 meters, including 11 meters, at $65 to a general coverage receiver for only $30. All of the above were kits, of course. How many Radio Shack stores were there in 1958? Two, Boston, Massachusetts and New Haven, Connecticut. Radio Shack had a six transistor portable radio for only $29.95, which was perfect for monitoring Conrad. But the big news in 1958 came from Collins. Late in the year, they introduced the S line of equipment. Collins took out glorious, exquisite, multi-page, full-color ads in QST to show off the 32S1 transmitter, the 75S1 receiver, and the 30S1 linear amplifier. A new standard had been set in amateur radio, and sideband was here to stay. On September 11, 1958, the FCC came to a decision. Our 11-meter band would be removed from us and turned over to the new Class C and Class D Citizens Band. A new concept was developing, that access to the airwaves should be made available to individuals for non-technical, non-hobby personal communications. It was the dawn of a new era. In our next installment, we'll look at amateur radio in the early 1960s. I hope you will join me. I'm Bill Cardinelli, W2XOY. The German National Amateur Radio Society, DARC, reports that an amateur radio school contact between the Laborious Gymnasium in Dessau and the Neumeyer 3 research station in Antarctica was successful. On February the 8th, at 10 a.m. local time in Germany, the students made contact with the South Pole as planned via the QO100 geostationary amateur radio satellite. The high school students had one hour to ask the scientists their questions about life and work at the Polar Research Station, which is operated by the Alfred Wegener Institute. Just some of the questions asked were, how does food get to the South Pole? What happens if someone falls ill? And what's life like in the polar night? These were amongst the topics that interested the young students, and they were able to put them to four people located at the Neumeyer 3 station. In addition to an air chemist, a meteorologist and a geophysicist, Teresa Toma, Delta Charlie 1 Tango Hotel, who's responsible for radio, electronics and IT in the research team, also took part in the school contact. The event was organised by teacher couple Jens, Delta Mike 4 Juliet Hotel and Catherine, Delta Oscar 8 Echo Charlie Charlie. They arranged the SCED and designed the supporting program, together with the participating students. The event at the Laborious Gymnasium ended with great applause and many happy faces. The contact was publicised by various media. One of the local television broadcasters, MDR, has produced a video showing footage of the contact that interested parties can access at www.mdr.de. They called the item Sparks, a hobby that broadens the horizon. And a bit more about Teresa Delta Charlie One Tango Hotel. She started her Antarctic adventure on December the 20th, 2020. As a member of the Winter Crew, the young radio amateur worked at the German research station Neumeyer 3, run by the Alfred Weniger Institute Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research, known as AWI for short. She will probably be on her way back to Germany in mid-February. And what a great inspiration to young people she is. The London BBC Radio Group marks 100 years of British broadcasting by operating its special event station GB100 BBC, 
A second group of hams in the UK is creating its own special event. The Chelmsford Amateur Radio Society is marking the centenary this month of a program aired on the 14th of February, 1922, 100 years ago, from a hut not far from Chelmsford, preceded by the familiar station announcement of This is Two Emma Talk. The program itself featured talk and the occasional piano music, all transmitted at 200 watts on a frequency of 428 kilohertz. This entertainment broadcast helped bring about the creation of what was to become the BBC in 1922. The Chelmsford Hams will be on HF, VHF, and UHF, and are operating all month as GB102MT. They will confirm QSOs via E, QSL, and Logbook of the World only. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station will conduct a digital slow-scan television experiment over Europe on Sunday, February 20th. ARIS, which arranges amateur radio contacts between students around the globe and ISS crew members, develops and operates the amateur radio equipment on the space station. The purpose of these experiments is to optimize future transmissions of SSTV images from the ISS and to investigate alternative transmission methods. As part of its ARIS 2.0 initiative, the ARIS International Team is expanding educational and lifelong learning opportunities for radio amateurs of all ages around the world. ARIS SSTV has been very popular, and to expand the SSTV capabilities on the ISS, the ARIS Europe and ARIS USA teams will carry out SSTV experiments using a new SSTV digital coding scheme. Receiving these SSTV signals requires the free KGSTV software, which is available for download. Radio amateurs are asked to refrain from using the ISS voice repeater on February 20th, so this experiment may be conducted. ARIS is temporarily employing the voice repeater to expedite these experiments and to make a more permanent and expansive SSTV capability fully operational on other downlink frequencies. The first experiment will utilize ARIS approved ground stations in Europe to transmit digital SSTV signals. These will be available for all who are within the ISS footprint when SSTV transmissions occur. The first SSTV experiment is planned for February 20th from 0510 to 1200 UTC for five ISS passes over Europe. This event depends on the availability of the ARIS interoperable radio system and ISS crew support, so last minute changes may occur. The interoperable radio system consists of a space-modified JVC Kenwood TMD710GA transceiver, an ARIS-developed multi-voltage power supply, and interconnecting cables. The design, development, fabrication, testing, and launch of the first interoperable radio system was the culmination of a five-year engineering effort by the ARIS hardware team of volunteers. The ARIS team will employ the TMD710GA in crossband repeater mode, which has a downlink of 437.8 MHz. Each sequence will consist of a 1 minute 40 second transmission, followed by a 1 minute 20 second pause. This will be repeated several times during an ISS pass over Europe. Signal modulation will be MSK, minimum shift keying, without error correction. For decoding of the 320 by 240 pixel image, download KGSTV. The zip file contains the KGSTV program, an installation and setup manual, some images and some MP3 audio samples for your first tests, as well as links for additional technical information about KGSTV. Experiment reports are welcome. More information will be available on the AMSAT NL webpage. A geomagnetic storm on February 4th significantly impacted the launch of some 49 Starlink satellites. The company said the satellites were intended to achieve low Earth orbits after being sent aloft on a Falcon 9 launcher. Starlink is a satellite internet constellation operated by SpaceX to provide satellite internet access around the globe. SpaceX said it initially deploys its satellites into low Earth orbit so that in the very rare case any satellite does not pass initial system checkouts, it will quickly be deorbited by atmospheric drag. All did not go as planned, however. Unfortunately, the satellites deployed on February 3rd were significantly impacted by a geomagnetic storm on Friday, February 4th, SpaceX announced this week.
these storms cause the atmosphere to warm and atmospheric density at our lower deployment altitudes to increase. In fact, onboard GPS suggests the escalation speed and severity of the storm caused atmospheric drag to increase up to 50% higher than during previous launches. Space weather forecaster Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, analyzed the incident in considerable detail in a recent update on her YouTube channel. I'm sure they did plan around it. The problem is the CME didn't, the CME arrived and then a second one arrived and then a third one arrived. And they were all in, in our observations, they were all kind of crushed together. So we didn't, we had a hard time seeing the ones that were kind of hiding behind. It was actually like a, a little train of, of, of solar storms all together. And we just didn't know. So when the first one arrived, everybody went, oh good, it's here, it's gone. Let's take a look at the conditions. No, the conditions are good, let's fly. And then whammo, I mean, it, well, and you'll see that in just a second. It was almost like the sun played a trick on everyone. And remember, what makes a solar storm strong is not the part you can see, it's the part you can't see. The satellites were commanded into a safe mode, whereas SpaceX explained they would fly edge on like a sheet of paper to minimize drag to effectively take cover from the storm and continue to work closely with the Space Force's 18th Space Control Squadron and LEO labs to provide updates on the satellites based on ground radars. A preliminary analysis showed that the increased drag at the low altitudes prevented the satellites from being moved into higher orbit, and up to 40 of the satellites will re-enter, or already have re-entered, Earth's atmosphere. The deorbiting satellites pose zero collision risk with other satellites, and by design, burn up on atmospheric re-entry, meaning no orbital debris is created and no satellite parts hit the ground, SpaceX said. The February 3rd launch sought to add the new satellites to the 2,000 or so already in the Starlink constellation providing space-based internet access. According to CNN, there are currently about 145,000 Starlink subscribers in 25 countries. Space weather forecaster Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, analyzed the incident in considerable detail in a recent update you can watch on YouTube. Time now for the AMSAT report. Do you know of a school that would like to get involved in teaching how satellites work? Would you like your very own CubeSat simulator? The AMSAT Education Department, along with Alan Johnston, KU2Y, have developed the AMSAT CubeSat simulator. The basic simulator is low cost and runs on solar panels and batteries. It transmits UHF radio telemetry and was designed with a 3D printed frame. There are additional sensors and modules which can be added for more experiments. Schools can even request a loaner system from AMSAT. Demos of the CubeSat sim have a light to represent the sun and a turntable to rotate the simulator. It's interesting to watch the telemetry as the solar panels are illuminated and then go into eclipse and see the effect on battery charging and discharging. Just a few of the things you can do with the CubeSat simulator to visualize what is actually happening. For more information, visit CubeSatSim, all one word, dot com. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. AMSAT Engineering is currently recruiting RF and mechanical engineers for its Fox Plus and Golf satellite programs. AMSAT is looking for an electronics engineer with RF experience for its Fox Plus program. You'll have the opportunity to design and build RF communication subsystems for a series of low Earth orbit 1U and 3U CubeSats to support AMSAT's educational and engineering objectives. You should have a working knowledge of analog and digital communications protocols, such as FM, PSK, and FSK to provide digitally synthesized audio for FM modulated VHF, UHF, and SHF voice and telemetry channels. Development opportunities can begin with modification of previous Fox designs and or by starting with a blank sheet for an original design. AMSAT is also looking for mechanical engineers to join its Fox Plus and Golf CubeSat teams. You'll have the opportunity to use your structural design and analysis skills in the development of a series of low Earth orbit and highly elliptical orbit 1U and 3U CubeSats to support AMSAT's educational and engineering objectives. Your contribution may include the development of a space frame and deployable solar panel subsystem. The analysis of thermal characteristics of the CubeSat and design of the thermal management system, preparation and oversight of the environmental testing procedure, 
and or management of documentation of the CubeSat's adherence to launch providers and space vehicle owner specifications. You will collaborate with AMSAT's all-volunteer teams of up to 12 electrical, mechanical, software, and system engineers. Our volunteers typically spend five hours per week on their project and attend a weekly online update meeting. An amateur radio license and CubeSat experience is helpful, but not necessary. United States citizenship or proof of permanent residency is required. Interested persons should send an email and their resume and curriculum vitae to volunteer at amsat.org. It's time for this week's propagation forecast report brought to us every week by Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington. He reports this week, although solar activity was generally lower this week, new sunspots appeared. A sunspot group emerged on February 10th, two more on February 11th, and two more on February 14th, and three more on February 16th, when the daily sunspot number rose to 111, the highest value for this reporting week and well above the weekly average, which was 75.3. The average for the previous week was 83.9. The February 16th count of 111 was the highest since the end of 2021, when sunspot numbers went as high as 147 following a few days with no sunspots at all. Average daily solar flux declined from 126 to 110.1. Average daily planetary A and ice went from 14.4 to 13. And the average daily middle latitude A index declined just 1.3 points to 8.3. Why do we care about sunspot numbers? because high values correlate with greater density in the ionosphere, which gives us better propagation at higher frequencies. 64 years ago, sunspot numbers were so high that amateurs saw worldwide around the clock propagation on 10 meters. Sunspot numbers have never been so high before or since. Taking a look at the predicted solar flux over the next few days, it'll be 108 on February 19th through the 27th, 110 on February 28th, and 115 on March 1st and 2nd. Looking at the predicted A index now, it'll be 15, 18, and 15 on February 19th through the 21st. It'll be 8 on February 22nd and 23rd, 15 and 10 on February 24th and 25th, and it'll be 5 on February 26th all the way through March 2nd. In the United Kingdom, the Royal Air Force Air Cadets are pleased to announce that they're running their ever-popular Blue Ham radio communications exercise in March 2022. This will take place on the 5 MHz band, which is shared between military and amateur stations. The exercise will take place over the weekend of the 26th and 27th of March, and, subject to your amateur callsign licensing conditions, they hope that you can put some time aside to join in with the cadets and staff who will be ready to take your calls. From early March, you'll be able to find details of the required contact exchange information on the Blue Ham website at alphacharlie.org.uk. And remember that this is a communications exercise, not a contest, so the required information exchange may not be what you're used to. Exercise log sheets are also available courtesy of Gary, Mike Zero, Papa Lima Tango on his website www.m0plt.me.uk and they are also to be found in the files section on the UK 60 meter band group Facebook page. The team will issue you with a Blue Hand Participation Certificate if you contact 15 or more of the special Mike Romeo Echo call signs over the period of the exercise. And details of how to apply for the certificate are on the alphacharlie.org.uk website. The Royal Air Force cadets hope to make contact with many radio amateurs on air during the exercise. Operators planning to participate in the ARRL International DX contest should be aware of some new entry categories and rule changes. The CW edition is this weekend, starting at 0000 UTC on Saturday, February 19th, Friday evening, February 18th in North American time zones, and concludes at 2359 UTC on Sunday, February 20th. New this year, the single operator, single band category has been expanded to include three power level subcategories, QRP, 5 watts PEP output or less, low power, 100 watts PEP output or less, and high power, 1500 watts PEP output, or the maximum allowable power level established by the National Licensing Authority issuing the operator and or station license, whichever is less, for both non-assisted and unlimited assisted entries. 
Also new for the ARRL DX 2022 affiliated club competition, multi-operator de-expedition scores, operations from outside the U.S. and Canada may be distributed among medium and unlimited category clubs that each operator declares. To be eligible to receive the scores, the club must be active in the ARRL's club eligibility listing and the operator's call sign must be included in the club's eligibility list. Each eligible operator's portion of the total station score will be attributed to the club of their choosing. The affiliated club competition rules include more details. In addition, multi-operator station accommodations put in place for 2021 have been extended to the 2022 running of the event. This permits multi-operator station participants to operate from their home stations in conjunction with a multi-operator station. The home stations must be within 100 kilometers, that's 62 miles, of the multi-operator station and must be within the same DXCC entity, U.S. state, or Canadian province. Complete rules and more information are available on the ARRL website. Amateurs and shortwave listeners around the world have signed up to celebrate St. Patrick's Day and vie for special awards during the 48 hours between the 16th and 18th of March. Organizers of the special St. Patrick's Award event have created a web page with details that include categories in which radio operators and listeners can compete and explanations of how they can qualify for awards. All participants need to visit the web page and register if they plan to apply for an award. All awards are available as downloadable PDFs after the event has concluded. Stations in Ireland, Canada, and the United States are among those who have already begun registering. The website lists when they will be on the air and in what modes, including DMR, PSK, and even on Hamshack Hotline. The website is stpatricksayward.com. That's stpatricksayward, all one word, dot com. Foundations of Amateur Radio Recently, I've spoken about measuring the frequency response of your radio and what the benefits of doing so might be. Today, I've got some progress to report and some initial discoveries. Again, this is preliminary, but then all of this hobby is experimentation, so that should come as no surprise. Let's start with the mechanics of what I'm doing and a der moment I need to confess. The aim of this process is to transmit a known audio signal, receive it, record it, and create a spectrogram from it. This allows us to compare the original spectrogram against the received one, and show you just how the audio path has been affected by getting the audio into the transmitter, the processing by the transmitter, the propagation between the transmitter and receiver, the artifacts introduced in the receiver, and any recording device. To begin this process, I started off with an audio file of my voice. That wasn't very helpful since it's a complex signal and comparing my voice before and after is a non-trivial process. At some point I intend to come back to voice before and after comparison, but that's on the shelf for now. The audio that I'm using is a frequency sweep lasting 5 seconds. That is, there's a tone that changes frequency from DC to 5 kHz. When I looked at the spectrogram of that it shows as a curve with time against frequency. It occurred to me that I could make two of those sweeps at the same time to measure distortion, so I added a reverse frequency sweep from 5 kHz down to DC. Now I've got two crossing lines showing in my spectrogram. To transmit this audio, I'm using the same tool I use to automatically call CQ during a contest. Every so many seconds I transmit this audio into a dummy load, and at this point I should mention that my de moment was that I was attempting to transmit into an antenna and record from a dummy load, rather than transmit into a dummy load and record from an antenna. I still cannot believe that I did that. Moving on. The recording is done using an RTL SDR dongle. In the current initial version, I'm using a tool called RTL FM to tune the dongle to the same frequency as my transmitter. I send the audio from there to the same tool I used to generate the original audio, socks that's Sierra Oscar X-Ray, and have it detect the silence between each transmission and record each into a new file. If I leave it running, every time I transmit something, SOX will create a new audio file. I'm saying that quite quickly, but getting the squelch and silence detection working in my noisy environment took most of a day, and it's specific to my station today. I'll have to figure out how to make this smarter, but for now I have some data. A spectrogram is generated for each audio file and then we can compare pictures. What was sent, audio-wise, and what was received, audio-wise. 
To be clear, I'm not sending images, I'm sending audio and comparing the spectrograms of this audio. I will also note that I'm currently using FM as the mode. I intended to do this with single sideband, but the amount of effort to get the squelch right has left me with a future project to achieve that. The code itself is pretty rudimentary, but I've uploaded it to my GitHub page. I've also added the pictures to my project website, which you can find at vk6flab.com. One initial observation, one that I don't yet understand, is that what I sent and what I received don't look the same. My pretty curves in the original audio come back with spectacular harmonics all over the place. Very pretty to be sure, but not quite what I was expecting. Let's call it an educational challenge. Before I forget, just because I'm using a Yaesu FT857D, a Raspberry Pi, an RTL SDR dongle, an antenna and a dummy load, doesn't mean that you need to. Essentially, what this does is generate a special audio file, transmit it, receive it, record it, and generate a spectrogram. You can play the audio from your own computer if you have digital modes set up, or from your mobile phone, if not. Recording can be something sophisticated with off-air monitoring, or it can be a recorder held in front of your receiver. One final note, you can change settings on both the transmitter and the receiver to see what they do in relation to the audio. So, experiment. I'm on a Victor Kilo 6 Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. And now, Parks on the Air news. Parks on the Air recently launched a new park management platform giving park managers a quick and easy way to manage their parks. As a result, we have recently brought 10 new programs into the Parks on the Air family. Keep your radios ready and listening for activations from Jamaica, Finland, Azores, Estonia, Guatemala, Bulgaria, St. Kitts and Nevis, South Africa, Ecuador, and the Russian Federation. With the growth of Poda DX, we are always looking for DX volunteers to help bring new entities online. If your country, or one you'd like to represent, is not yet part of Poda, please reach out via the Contact Us link from ParksOnTheAir.com and we'll help you get started as a volunteer country administrator. January also marked the completion of the Winter Support Your Parks event. In spite of the cold, 582 activators put 747 parks on the air from 23 different DX entities. With WA7PBE making the most activator QSOs, AE0MME activating the most parks. On the hunting side, N3XLS made the most hunter QSOs and also hunted the most parks. In DX during the event, VE3XNS made the most DX QSOs as an activator and JF7RJM activated the most parks. In the club category, K4YTZ took home the prize as the club that made the most QSOs during the two-day weekend. And now for the monthly stats update. Beginning in 2022, we'll be shifting our focus during the monthly updates to spend more time talking about the number of activations. After all, that's what POTA is all about. Winter is certainly not slowing down the amount of activity in POTA. During the month of January, there were 7,702 activations out of 8,016 attempts, made by 1,472 activators from 3,105 different parks located in 32 different DX entities. The top activator for the month was K4NYM, who did 142 activations from 62 different parks. The top hunters for the month were CU3HY, who hunted 909 parks, and N3XLS, who made 1,662 QSOs as a hunter. We'd like to call special attention to the fact that this was the first time a DX station topped the overall charts during our monthly updates. Congratulations, Mike. In our POTA DX corner, just like last month, England was our Region 1 leader with 42 activations, Canada was our Region 2 leader with approximately 315 activations, and Japan was our Region 3 leader with 299 activations. The top DX activator for the month was JF7RJM with 59 activations from 45 different parks. Congratulations to JF7RJM and Japan for the first month where the DX category charts were topped by a station outside of Region 2. And last but not least, Let's check in on the progress of the Bailey Sprott Challenge. In 2021, N5HA and W9AV each managed to hunt a park every single day. So in 2022, we're following along to see if anyone else can match their feet. At 30 days into the month, we have five activators who have activated every day of the year. WC1N, KE8, PZN, 
N2 NWK, KB3 WAV, and KD4 MZN. We also have had 91 hunters who have contacted an activator every single day. To all of the Bailey Sprott chasers, congrats on your success so far, and we look forward to seeing how you do throughout the year. For January's bonus feature, we're going to touch on one aspect of logging that sometimes causes confusion. What is the difference between station and operator in the ADIF files, and how does POTA actually use them? At its most basic level, we only need to look as far as the ADIF standard. The station call sign is the logging station's call sign, or the call sign used over the air, and the operator is the logging operator's call sign. One of the most common mistakes we see is activators putting things in the operator field that aren't call signs, things like names and initials. In most situations, when an activator is out by themselves, they are both the station and the operator and should have their call sign in both fields. The only scenario in POTA where you would normally have a different station and operator is when you are doing a club activation. The call sign being given over the air is something different from your own. Refer back to the ADIF definition of the logging station's call sign, i.e. the call sign used over the air. The way this is used in POTA is so that the club, i.e. the station, can do the activation, but members of the club who aren't actually giving their own call signs over the air can still get activator credit for the QSOs where they are the operator. Because this is a single contact, it is stored once and the hunter gets credit for one QSO. The station and operator fields are not intended to be a way to shortcut logging if two people are activating together and giving both call signs over the air. If this is done, the system would behave as though one of the activators was a club and the other was an individual. This would only store one QSO and the hunter would only get one credit. Furthermore, some of our monthly reporting and SYP event data would exclude the call sign in the station field when we are evaluating totals for individual prizes because it looks like a club log. If you are passing the bike and both making contacts, you both need to submit your own log so that you don't shortchange your hunters or yourselves. This concludes our January 2022 Parks on the Air update. Thank you to everyone who provided pictures for us to share during the video updates. We'll be cycling through them over the next several months. If you have pictures you'd like to see during the video version of these updates, send them to November 3, Victor Echo Mike at parksontheair.com. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Robert, 9 November 7 Alpha Alpha, has just returned from a short trip to his location in Kathmandu, Nepal, and says that his shipment of more equipment has now arrived from Kabul, Afghanistan. During the visit, he managed to set up parts of his station, however, a lot remains to be done still. He was able to install the rotator for his Ultra Beam 2 Element Yagi antenna, which covers 40 meters to 6 meters, and he reports that the system works very well. But he also reported that man made noise problems had not disappeared during his absence, and that it's really severe due to the widespread use of cheap LED lights, open and messy power lines, and inverters. On all bands, the signal strength meter rarely, if ever, drops below S6 to 7. Robert said that it was slightly better when beaming towards the east, and he apologised that due to the noise, he was not always able to hear every caller. For the time being, Robert's activity will only be on 40 to 6 metres, while the 80 and 160 metre antenna remains a project for the summer months. This will also give him some extra time to try and find a solution to the noise interference. And for those who constantly ask, the 60 meter band is not permitted in Nepal. You can QSL Robert directly via his home call sign Sierra 57 Delta X ray in Slovenia. And of course, Logbook of the World and Club Log will be updated at least once a week. OQRS will be coming soon. There's a great photo of Robert's Nepal house with the antennas. Just go to this story on the Southgate Amateur Radio News website. And Robert asks us to note that his call sign 9 November 7 Alpha Alpha was previously operated by Andy Uniform Alpha 3 Alpha Alpha. QSL information for Andy's operation from March to April 2014 is via Andy's home address at PO Box 873, Brooklyn, New York. And Simon, Golf 6 Juliet Foxtrot Yankee, has been on the island of Mauritius since mid-January. He says that he's rented a nice house with a big garden and hopes to be on the air in the next month or so with his 3 Bravo 8 call sign. 
As of February the 12th, Simon was using the call sign 3 Bravo 8 stroke Golf 6 Juliet Foxtrot Yankee, and you can look him up on qrz.com. However, Simon has also applied for a full 3 Bravo 8 license. He already has his 12 meter and 80 meter spider bean poles with him, but he reported last month that he hopes to do some low band DXing. Simon said he was very happy with the reception on 160 meters and is regularly spotted on the DX reflectors using that band. He does have his Mauritius address listed on QRZ.com, but suggests it will be better to listen on air for the best QSL route. A further look into airliners RFI problems following the recent launch of 5G service by U.S. cell phone carriers, has turned up an interesting technical finding. According to the UrgentCom website, despite a protective guard band to separate frequencies used by cell phone carriers and airliners, signals from the newly deployed 5G wireless service in the U.S. are still capable of compromising commercial airplane safety and aircraft using older altimeters lacking filters an expert witness told U.S. lawmakers in Washington, D.C. Dennis Roberson told the subcommittee in the U.S. House of Representatives that older radio altimeters lack filters that prevent that kind of risky signal conflict that can interfere with critical navigation, especially during landing. His testimony came following airlines' decision to ground or redirect some of their flights scheduled to land in airports near 5G cell phone towers. Carriers including AT&T and Verizon now operate on the C-band spectrum between 3.7 and 3.98 gigahertz. Altimeters are designed to operate on frequencies between 4.2 and 4.4 gigahertz. Roberson said this kind of interference is not believed to have been a factor in any crashes, but the potential does exist because older altimeters are capable of picking up transmissions outside of their assigned band, such as those used by the 5G service. He said that a guard band provided a large cushion between the carriers and the altimeters allocations on the spectrum. Nonetheless, without filters in place on the altimeters, signal conflicts still could occur. On February the 19th and 20th, three special event amateur radio stations will celebrate the 80th anniversary of the famous American broadcaster, The Voice of America. It was on February the 1st, 1942, that the first transmission from Voice of America stations in the USA to Europe commenced to correct the propaganda and misinformation that Nazi Germany was broadcasting to the world. VOA committed to telling the truth, whether it was good or bad. The highest ideals of journalism would be maintained to counter propaganda with truth and trust. For 80 years, this organization has continued to fight fake news and informed the world through unbiased radio. For much of the world population, VOA was the only source they could get, providing reports that they could trust. Today, this mission is even more vital to the peace of the globe. To honor this 80-year commitment, three stations have been invited by VOA to be special event stations in the amateur radio bands, with the call signs Whiskey 3 Victor for VOA in Washington, D.C., Whiskey 8 Oscar, which is at the VOA Museum in West Chester, Ohio, and Whiskey 4 Alpha at VOA in Greenville, North Carolina. The three suffixes spell out VOA, of course. This event is scheduled to take place on February the 19th and 20th from 14 to 22 hours UTC each day. Operating modes will be single sideband, CW and FT8 on the 20, 40 and 80 meter bands. Single sideband will operate around 14.280, 7.280 and 3.880 MHz and move up or down to find a clear frequency. It's a pity that the 40 and 80 meter frequencies chosen are not permissible in Europe. Morse frequencies will be in the CW general portion of the band. Check DX spots to find the stations at a specific time. FT8, the data mode, will be on the frequencies set by the WSJTX software. Amateur radio stations that contact the VOA stations will get an electronic QSL card via email from each special event station automatically if their email is correct on QRZ.com. An electronic certificate will also be sent in PDF format that has contact acknowledgement and information about the stations. Callers who wish to get paper QSL cards should contact the VOA stations directly and send self-addressed stamped envelopes. The cards will be mailed after the event.
There's more on the VOA 80th anniversary pages at w4amc.com forward slash 2022. That's whiskey for alpha Mike Charlie dot com forward slash 2022. AMSAT South Africa is looking for presenters for its virtual symposium being held this coming July. With the COVID-19 pandemic still a major concern, AMSAT South Africa will be holding its annual space symposium as a virtual event again this year. The one-day event will take place on Saturday, the 23rd of July, showcasing the theme space, the next frontier for expansion of amateur radio. Organizers are still seeking proposals for papers and are asking that all prospective presenters send in their submissions by March 31st. Each presenter will receive a time slot of 20 to 30 minutes and will be given a 10 minute period for questions and answers. Topics may range from the basics on how to use handheld transceivers to work with satellites all the way to more complex issues, such as building satellites or conducting space research with a space weather station. Accepted presentations are due in by the 1st of July in Microsoft Word and PowerPoint format. For details, email organizers at admin at amsatsa.org.za. The Chinese Radio Amateurs Club has announced that Beijing 2022 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games Special Events Station BY1CRA slash W022 is now active on FTB, SSB, and CW on 160 through 10 meters and will operate until the Games close on February 20th. Contact awards are available. A log of stations contacted are posted to the club log. The Daily Mail newspaper in the UK has published a well-illustrated article about the extensive radio collection of Richard Allen from Norfolk in the east of England. Richard, a retired electrical engineer, has spent the last 50 years collecting antique transistor, valve and crystal sets and has now shown off his impressive collection of more than 200 pieces. The 85-year-old first fell in love with radio because of his father, Alexander, who was a radio amateur and built his own transmitter, speaking to people all over the world through the airwaves. In fact, Richard's first and favourite radio within his collection is the one his father played non-stop during World War II after purchasing it in 1938. Richard's father held the very early call sign 2 Alpha Whiskey Alpha and his stepmother was Golf 3 Hotel Yankee Lima. Another notable piece within his collection is an E-52B German military radio, captured in a vehicle in England at Foxhill near Bath, which was where his father worked in the Admiralty. He also owns a Regency Pocket Radio, which was the first transistor radio to be commercially manufactured in 1954. His collection includes a Marconi Phone 253 dating from 1933, but the oldest item is a three-valve Beltona ham radio unit, which is over 96 years old. And Richard said that whilst he's in his workshop, he makes sure that at least one of his radios is tuned to BBC Radio Norfolk. You can read the detailed Daily Mail story at www.dailymail.co.uk forward slash news. And there's a huge amount of information on Richard Allen's personal website at www.richardsradios.co.uk. It really is well worth a look. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. When climbing on a commercial tower, we need to be aware of RF safety laws. Exposure has been the subject of debate lately, especially since the guidelines have been introduced into the amateur's vocabulary. There are certain requirements you need to be aware of. Some are required by law and some are not. This all depends on the tower and how it is loaded with commercial services. For those of you who are not aware of the federally mandated safety guidelines, there's a general set of rules about working safely with sources of energy. Lockout, tagout is a phrase which refers to the use of safety devices to help prevent accidental injury to workers servicing equipment. On towers, lockout, tagout can include seals on breaker switches, inline coax switches, or other similar devices. I'm not going to refer to any specifics, but to good personal safety guidelines. If you are working on a shorter tower with perhaps a few paging systems, you need to consider exposure to RF as well as the risk of injury from contact with active antennas. When you are working on or near an antenna or its feed line, 
you must ensure that it is difficult or impossible for someone to turn on the transmitter while you are on the tower. If you are at 250 feet and your partner is on the ground, another person working in the transmitter shack could easily turn on the transmitter that is attached to your body. It is your responsibility to unplug the transmitter's power cord or remove the fuses, mark or lock the breaker so anyone else not involved in your work cannot accidentally turn on the injury causing transmitter. Before you start working, make sure everyone in the area is aware of what should or should not be turned on and install some sort of locking device. A cable tie is suitable as a lockout in many circumstances. I sometimes put cable ties through the holes in the prongs of a 115 volt plug to prevent it from being plugged in while I'm on the tower. If I'm working on a hard wired system, I may remove the coax and cable tie it to something inside the cabinet along with something like my car keys to prevent me from forgetting to reconnect the coax as well as preventing it from getting turned on and cooking my fingers off. When working on a crowded tower, you may have to arrange to climb at pre-scheduled off-air times to minimize exposure to powerful RF fields. I will not climb near an active broadcast antenna and prefer to climb near active paging system antennas during off-peak times. This is another reason why I prefer to climb at night. The essence of lockout tagout is to ensure that the system you're working on is at or very close to a zero potential energy state. Equally important is that the energy supply to the device is locked in a zero energy state by any reasonable means which would prevent a casual user from activating the device while you are working on it. Some simple methods of locking out a transmitter would include shutting off a breaker and locking it in the off position, removing fuses and locking the fuse box shut, switching off a breaker and using a hardware store breaker lock and tag to mark it out of service. For the home-based amateur, shutting off the power to the radios connected to the tower is a good beginning. Unplugging power cords or unhooking coax wires is another. Here's another good reason to have a ground crew. They can also become involved in lockout tagout. Just remember to lower each device to a zero energy state before starting the climb. Sometimes this is not possible, but always plan for the safest climb. After doing it several times, it'll become second nature to you. There's a lot more on lockout tagout than I have time to cover here. So if you're climbing for a living, be sure to review your employer's safety and exposure guidelines. Another place to look for information is the OSHA webpage or your state's electrical safety codes. Remember, you cannot tell if an antenna is transmitting just by looking at it. Direct contact with a transmitting antenna can leave you with an instantaneous and very painful burn. Getting a second degree burn on the palm of your hand at 150 feet on a tower would ruin anyone's day. Also keep in mind that just because a transmitter is unplugged, it may still offer a small voltage difference between the tower and that antenna. It is impossible to attain the exact same ground potential between all the systems on a tower. So the risk of a shock while climbing will always be present. Just be careful when you touch antennas on towers. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, when tuning across the ham bands, you never know what you'll encounter. This week, for instance, you might hear operators talking about the planet Pluto and its discovery. The Northern Arizona DX Association is again hosting its annual Pluto Anniversary Countdown, celebrating the discovery of the planet by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930. This is the second year for the special event from the Lowell Observatory in Arizona. The special event will end in its centennial year of 2030. You may hear stories like some from last year, when contacts talked about meeting the famed astronomer at their grade school, at star parties, or through an astronomy course. One contact, Uno Carlson, KC3EJS, 
was an aerospace engineer and part of the team for the New Horizons project that did a flyby of Pluto in 2015. Look for W7P on the air through February 21st. You might even have a chance to talk with Doug Tombaugh and 3PDT, nephew of the man whose discovery changed a bit of how we look at our galaxy. Doug and four other hams are operating as W7P slash zero. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on amateur radio repeater systems, streaming on the internet, or on great low-power FM broadcast stations like WGXC-FM, part of the Wave Farm on 90.7 MHz in Accra, New York, serving Greene County and the southern regions of New York's Capital District. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 73.